about, about 50 years ago, the late George Plimpton took the poet Marianne Moore to a baseball game at Yankee Stadium to see the Yankees play the Brooklyn Dodgers. Uh, Miss Moore's observations were priceless. As Junior Gilliam walked up to the plate to bat, she said, he is simulating sang froid, <laughs> which Plimpton later observed was no doubt the only time the word sang froid has ever been uttered within the confines of Yankee Stadium. <laughs> Of the double play, Miss Moore said, it is a cruel but necessary thing. <laughs> well, we don't have Marianne Moore with us this morning, but we do have an outstanding group of speakers who will, with no doubt equal creativity, <coughs> be tackling one of the toughest topics before us. How does the US leverage its power to get its allies and others to respect human rights when it has a whole host of other interests at stake in those relationships. Human rights are almost never, as Secretary Albright said, are almost never the only and rarely the principal nexus of bilateral relations. And yet they often have profound implications for other strategic interests like security, trade, environmental hazard. Now our panel is going to sort all of this out for us today starting with the moderator, Brian Katulis, a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress who specializes in national security policy in relationship especially to the Middle East, Iraq, and Pakistan. Brian has just co-authored with Nancy Soderberg a new book entitled The Prosperity Agenda, which will be published this summer by John Wiley and Sons. Brian. Thanks, Bill. Thank you all for coming this morning. And I want to thank our co-host to the Georgetown University Law Center. For the past four and a half years, the Center for American Progress has worked to tackle some of the toughest policy challenges our country faces. And uh, under John Podesta's leadership, we've gathered some of the most innovative thinkers to address head on some of the most difficult national security, economic, and domestic policy challenges. Today's conference is a continuation of, uh, of this tradition of addressing some of the toughest questions head on. And I'd like to congratulate Bill Schultz and his co-authors on the publication and launch of their new book, the, the Future of Human Rights. We have an ambitious agenda in the next hour and a half um, in this morning's panel. The central question is, how should the United States deal with the human rights abuses of partners and allies? In countries where the United States has other strategic interests, whether it's security interests, like addressing the threat posed by global terrorist networks or economic interests such as trade ties or oil. Our aim this morning is to be pragmatic. We hope that the discussion will produce concrete recommendations for the next administration. Um, as difficult and uh, challenging as, as these issues are with, with the countries that we're addressing. And it's, it's, it's tough for me to think of a more experienced and knowledgeable group of experts uh, to have today. What we're going to do is spend about 10 minutes each drilling down on three specific countries, China, Pakistan, and Egypt. I'll introduce our four speakers. They'll give introductory remarks for about seven to 10 minutes each. We'll have a conversation, and then we'll open it up to your questions. Our first speaker is Ambassador James Sasser. Ambassador Sasser served as senator from Tennessee for 18 years, from 1976 to 1994. And from 1996 to 1999, he served as the US ambassador to Beijing. He's going to start our, discu our discussion this morning by focusing his remarks on China. Then we'll head west to Pakistan, uh, where Steve Cole, the president and CEO of the New America Foundation, will focus his remarks on the challenges that the US faces in Pakistan, particularly related to human rights. Steve's the staff writer at the New Yorker magazine. And he's the author of numerous books, including the most recent, The Bin Ladens, An Arabian Family in the American Century. And you can see him tomorrow night on The John Stewart Show, <laughs> which he's very nervous about, by the way. So please watch. <laughs> Jennifer Windsor uh, will take us to Egypt. We'll continue our journey westward to Egypt. Jennifer is the executive director of Freedom House, uh, has served in that role since January of 2001. And prior to Freedom House, Jennifer worked in the, uh, uh, in the Clinton administration at the US Agency for International Development on Democracy and Governance. Uh, 
And finally, uh, the, in the tough role of cleanup and trying to draw all of these threads together with me is Ambassador John Shattuck, who is currently the Chief Executive Officer of the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation. He's also a senior fellow and lecturer at the uh, College of Citizenship and Public Service at Tufts University. He has a long and distinguished career um, in public service. He served as U.S. Ambassador to the Czech Republic from 1998 to 2000. And prior to that, he was Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. Ambassador Sasser. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Brian. I'll try to confine myself to the 10-minute limit here. That's going to be difficult for <clears throat> a former senator, you know, a senator can hardly clear his throat in 10 minutes. <laughs> After years and years of filibustering, it uh, takes a while to get your thoughts condensed. Uh, let me just say this at the outset, uh, talking about uh, human rights, and Secretary Albright may or may not have touched on this this morning in her remarks, but I think we can all understand that the United States, uh, our stature, with regard to discussing human rights worldwide and our credibility has been, I think, somewhat diminished over the past years as a result of things like Abu Ghraib, Guantanamo, and perhaps uh, one or two other incidents. Others may question us, particularly the Chinese, although they may be polite enough not to raise it to our face. Uh, would think that our, our uh, views on human rights are somewhat jaundiced in the sense that we uh, apply human rights criteria to them, but perhaps are not so strict in applying it to ourselves. Uh, during my tenure uh, in China and during my years of interest uh, in Sino-US American, uh, Sino-American relations, I think I've seen the emphasis, at least at the highest levels of our government, on human rights decline uh, considerably uh, in bringing it up, for example, in the dialogue with the Chinese and also putting it as one of the uh, principal um, tenets of our policy towards the Chinese. I well remember when uh, president Bill Clinton was running for president in 1992. One of the things he talked about fairly often was denouncing the Chinese record on human rights and describing them, some of them, as the butchers of Tenement. Uh, during the course of his administration, as John Shattuck, I think, will uh, attest to, we very often brought up the question of human rights with the Chinese. And during my tenure in China, I saw it decline more and more and more uh, in our dialogue with the Chinese. That is, it declined in, in importance and saw the economic relationship and the economic dialogue become more and more important. And I think even now with the, uh, with the six party talks in Asia, security interest are becoming more and more important in the dialogue as the Chinese have been instrumental in advancing the uh, discussions with uh, the People's Republic of North Korea in uh, trying to uh, discourage them from making any further advances in the nuclear field. But uh, I, I well remember when President Clinton came to China in a historic visit, uh, I think it was 1919, 1998 or 99, I'm not sure which, but there was a lot of discussion about whether or not he should be greeted or allow himself to be seen being greeted in Tenement Square, uh, the uh, Great Hall of the People where the uh, opening ceremonies were to be held between the two heads of state was on the edge of Tenement Square. And uh, we thought at that time it would be a great political liability, perhaps, for President Clinton to be seen on the edge of Tenement Square with the history of that place. But now uh, I think that that would not, would not be the case. Uh, we see that the Bush administration um, uh, is not considering, at least outwardly, as far as I can discern, any sort of 
of retribution or any repercussions uh, directed against the Chinese as a result of what's happening in Tibet. Uh, our government is not uh, discussing at all uh, the question of whether or not we should uh, even, uh, even boycott the opening ceremonies uh, to the Olympics. So I, I say that by way of indicating to you that over a period of, of a decade, uh, or maybe a decade and a half, what we've seen is the emphasis on human rights in policy vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese has declined uh, very considerably. And the emphasis, I think, now is on economic ties and uh, to a lesser degree, the dialogue is about security interest. And as evidence of the fact that economic uh, matters are taking um, the lead, the Secretary of the Treasury now has instituted a policy of every three months. Uh, the top uh, commercial leaders of the U.S. government meet with the top commercial leaders of the Chinese government, and uh, they alternate between, uh, between Beijing uh, and Washington. Um, now, what's to be done about moving the Chinese more in the direction of respecting human rights? Well, the fact is that we can't do very much. Uh, as we see now in Tibet, uh, there's a lot of discussion here in the United States uh, and discussion worldwide, but almost no movement uh, on the part of our government in trying to drive home the view that, uh, uh, that Tibetans should have more individual rights and that their cultural and economic interests should be respected by, by the Chinese. As we have become more interdependent with the Chinese government, as they now own about $400 billion worth of U.S. government securities uh, and are helping finance uh, our indebtedness, our international indebtedness, we have lost, I think, a considerable amount of our leverage and we've also lost some of our moral leverage, as I said earlier, with regard to our actions over the past past few years. So what I would advise the next administration to do with regard to human rights uh, and advancing human rights in China is to continue to have a dialogue with the Chinese on the question of human rights and to, and to um, ally our dialogue with the Chinese on human rights with the European Union, and we should come at it, I think, as a united group. Uh, the Chinese very much want to be respected on the world stage. They very much want to be uh, players, uh, and as a result of that, uh, as evidence of that, you can see their, their interest in trying to uh, garner the Olympics and the, uh, the um, uh, gargantuan efforts they've made to try to make this Olympics a success. The billions and billions of dollars they spent for remodeling Beijing uh, to, to accept uh, and to put their best foot forward to the world as far as the Olympics are concerned. So I think if the next administration could take a unified approach with the European Union and others uh, and put human rights back in as an important part of the dialogue and not try to do it uh, by ourselves, I think that would be the most uh, persuasive effort we could make with the Chinese. But we would have to, have to realize that our efforts are the results and our leverage are very, very limited. We're now dealing with a country which is, is uh, is uh, becoming a, a, an economic power, has become an economic power on the world stage, now the third largest economy in the world, is becoming a strategic diplomatic country, as evidenced by their uh, leverage uh, in North Korea. And uh, we're dealing with them more now, uh, more and more every day, as on the, on the, on, on the basis of, of equals. Uh, so uh, uh, 
friendly persuasion is about all we have left, I think, as far as the Chinese are concerned, and we, needed to, we need to have a united effort uh, in going forward. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, Steve, uh, friendly persuasion. Is there more that we can do with Pakistan than, than friendly persuasion? We, we seem to have uh, many points of leverage and a lot of contact. And, and Thank you. Yes, I do, I do think the levers are different. Um, and maybe more promising, though certainly not um, a, any, anything like uh, a sure path uh, to success. It, just to briefly set the recommendations that I've sketched in uh, context, I think it's important to start with the observation that in Pakistan, despite the headlines and the rhythm of crisis that we're all familiar with, a constitutional democracy does not need to be invented. It just needs to be revived and supported. Pakistan was born as a constitutional democracy, and it has struggled to achieve the ideals of its founders. But there is a great national investment and a pluralistic national investment in those ideals that is still present today. And ultimately, human rights in Pakistan is a question that will be managed, and I think optimistically successfully managed by Pakistanis within the framework of those constitutional ideals. And I think that's important to observe because American policy is often and has recently been out of alignment with that essential observation about Pakistan's history and potential. In recent uh, years, this problem has been particularly acute because of the crisis of uh, political violence in Pakistan and the responses of the state to that violence. Essentially, uh, the election, the, the, the year 2007 was one of the most tumultuous in recent Pakistani political history. We reach the first end of the first quarter of 2008 in a calmer uh, time where that narrative has more or less played itself out, culminating in a successful election earlier this year. But the election occurred in, almost in, in, a, in a context of insurgency and crisis and was itself advertised as a, as a mechanism of counterinsurgency. And I think in Washington, the election was embraced not so much because there had been a change of view about the role of democracy and human rights in the creation of a stable Pakistan, but because in desperation, the administration was persuaded that an election might be a form of counterinsurgency superior to those that they had pursued earlier. And that takes us to another uh, important framework in Pakistan, which is this continual tension between security and human rights. And uh, of course, it's a very real dilemma. It's not an invented uh, problem. But as with um, many such dilemmas in other countries, while there are genuine sources of emergency in Pakistan that require emergency measures, it is also true that the use of the emergency is often false and creates a false construct of security versus human rights. And without going into too much detail because of the time we have, I just wanted to give one example. Quite a lot of the, of the crisis in 2007 that led to the state of emergency that Musharraf imposed and then the pressure on him to lift that state of emergency and the elections and quite a lot of the decision that Musharraf made to overthrow the independent judiciary was located in the judiciary's decision to insist on reviews about detentions. And the Americans uh, were particularly supportive of the Army's refusal to participate in these reviews of detentions because the Americans argued Al-Qaeda in Pakistan is as great an emergency as we face globally. It requires extraordinary measures. In a perfect world, we wouldn't wish to have these kinds of detentions, populations in the hundreds uh, with no review, essentially a population of disappeared. We regret it, but the emergency is that severe. That was essentially the administration's attitude, and that was the Army's attitude. And it was to defend these detentions that Musharraf essentially sacked the Supreme Court, also to preserve his own power. Well, it turns out that the population of the detained was not primarily Islamist. The population of the detained was primarily Baluch and Sindh uh, secessionist. Uh, 
And essentially the army had used its own, uh, the, the construct of the U.S. emergency to go after what it perceived to be a series of domestic secession and political problems uh, of long standing. So anyway, this is just one example among many about how this construct uh, is misused and, and sort of falsified. So what, what could the United States do? I had uh, one sort of strategic framework I wanted to suggest and then four small suggestions, uh, really just sketches. The strategic framework is probably the most important thing. The United States ought to pursue a stable, peaceful, modernizing, democratic Pakistan that is at peace with itself and its neighbors and that is in pursuit of its own ideals of constitutional democracy. This is an achievable project over 25 to 50 years. It's achievable primarily because India next door, which already possesses such a constitutional order, is on the verge of a transformation in society, wealth, prosperity, middle class formation. And the only strategic obstacle to India's generational success is failure in Pakistan. And on the other hand, if Pakistan can settle down and provide even a modicum of stability, it will benefit from this transformation. It will ride India's uh, coattails as well as those of the Gulf into its own middle class uh, based future. So that framework is achievable, but it can only be achieved inside a democratic order. U.S. The United States has significant but limited levers to participate in this project. One is to rebalance its aid. Since 9-11, uh, of the $10 billion plus in overt aid and another two or three probably in covert, 90% has gone to the military. This is uh, not helpful to this project. And the, the rebalancing of aid should be directed towards civil society, free media, human rights groups. The biggest funders of Pakistan's courageous human rights networks today are the Norwegians. And that, that is a position that the United States should not be uh, ceding uh, this, in this way. I think, two, the United States should develop a sustainable approach to the Army's role in the Constitution and create a context for a professional military that sees the Geneva Accords and its own version of the Uniform Code of Military Justice as the basis of its action. This is also achievable. Third, human rights in Pakistan and everywhere else are located in the experiences of civilian populations. It's important to emphasize that those rights can be violated not only by the state but by militia groups as happens all the time in Pakistan and in fact Al-Qaeda's popularity in Pakistan has collapsed because it has targeted civilian populations in, in the country. And finally, the United States does have the ability to try to reduce the frictions that give rise to state violence and state abuse in Pakistan and those are primarily located in Kashmir and Afghanistan. Uh, there, the, the militarization of Pakistani society and its role in disrupting the constitution is partly attributable to the actual threats that the Pakistan military perceives from its neighbors and, and from the geopolitical context in which it sits. And the United States should, should be able to play a role and ought to try to play a role uh, to reduce those frictions. Great. Thank you, Steve. Jennifer, you've uh, s served in the trenches both in the government and in non-governmental organizations trying to push forward democracy and human rights. And though you currently have a global focus, you have a great deal of experience in Egypt, which has been an interesting country um, for a long period of time, but particularly over the last couple of years as relates to human rights and democracy. I thought maybe you could, could add to the discussion by talking about your experiences there. Great. Thank you. And thank you for including me. Uh, President Mubarak of Egypt has ruled under a military state of emergency for almost three decades. During that time, he has received billions of dollars of U.S. assistance and has been lauded as a key ally and even a Democrat. <coughs> Today, as we speak, the Egyptian people are indicating their dissatisfaction with his government. After a call to action from a Facebook group, a general strike has been ongoing to protest the rising cost of living within Egypt. Some people stayed home but did not buy certain commodities. Others demonstrated an illegal action in Egypt. Security forces were out en masse, and while demonstrations in Cairo were largely peaceful, in other parts of the country's clashes turned violent, and reportedly a number were killed, including a nine-year-old boy. Over 100 people were arrested, 
The demonstrations continue today, and a new strike is to be called for early May. Today, Egypt is holding local elections. The turnout is low. The Muslim Brotherhood decided to boycott the elections after the government arrested hundreds of members, including 40 leaders, and systematically denied the opportunity for the majority of candidates to run. In past elections, once secular liberal opposition groups began to present genuine challenges to the NDP's monopoly of power, they were subject to intimidation and arrest. The most visible case, of course, is Ayman Noor. When he was arrested in January 2005, Secretary Rice, in an unprecedented action, canceled a trip to Egypt in protest, eventually resulting in Noor's release. He has now been imprisoned since then, and in the last month, his final appeal to be released because of his serious health condition was turned down. In this case, Secretary of State Rice did not publicly show her displeasure. In fact, she recently waived congressional conditions on improvements on human rights and rule of law, conditions which were imposed on a paltry sum, $100 million, out of the $1.3 billion worth of military assistance that the U.S. provides. The government of Egypt didn't hesitate to make it clear that they saw this as a PR victory. Thanks to Egyptian journalists, especially bloggers, who have refused to observe the red lines that have previously restricted their work, freedom of expression has expanded in Egypt. But serious threats remain. Two weeks ago, a prominent independent journalist and editor of Al Dustur newspaper was charged with spreading false news about the president's health to harm the national economy. In Egypt, freedom of association and assembly are heavily restricted, and force is used if ne as necessary, as we can see in recent events. But more subtle forms of intimidation and repression are also in place. Egyptian laws regulating NGOs have become worse over the years, not better. Again, the high-profile case is Dr. Saad Ed Ibrahim, who remains in self-exile with dozens of legal cases against him and others because he discussed aid conditionality with President Bush during the Prague conference last year. But many other individuals and groups whose names are not so famous have, like Dr. Ibrahim, suffered for crossing the line. In June 2005, at, the AU, uh, at AUC in Cairo, Secretary Rice spoke on democratic reform. Quote, the day is coming when the promise of a free and democratic world, once thought impossible, will also seem inevitable. The people of Egypt should be at the forefront of this great journey. So together, let us choose liberty and democracy. The Bush administration's action during the 2003 to 2000 period including the withholding of $30 million of assistance, the delay of Rice's trips, and direct aid to a number of human rights groups, did lead to a package of modest reforms on the part of the Egyptian government. And civil society journalists, political leaders, and human rights activists have responded by pushing the envelope. Unfortunately, since that time, critical public statements have virtually stopped, although Secretary Rice and other administration officials assure us that they are raising issues in private. And Secretary Rice, to her credit, continues to meet with Egyptian civic activists. But the Bush administration's clear retreat from its forward-leaning policy in the last two years has given the Mubarak regime an opening to renew its repression throughout the country and has left Egypt's would-be reformers exposed and disillusioned on their journey to liberty and democracy. But let us be clear, the Bush administration's policy was a step forward from the past. The Clinton administration was virtually silent about human rights abuses in Egypt. And in fact, uh, an individual was rendered to Egypt and suffered torture at the hands of the Egyptian government during that time. Successive U.S. administrations have continued a bilateral agreement which effectively allowed the Egyptian government to determine which NGOs received assistance and eliminated any leverage to pressure the Egyptians to respect fundamental human rights. Security, stability, and other interests have always prevailed in U.S. policy towards Egypt. But have those policy actually advanced U.S. interests? Let us answer honestly. What has the Bush administration gotten for its recent silence and for billions of dollars? A successful peace process in the Middle East? 
Have past U.S. policies really led to stability and security in Egypt? I think not. If there is no peaceful, effective way to voice opposition or to choose a successor to Mubarak, then the people will find an outlet. Repression empowers extremists. It does not eliminate them. It is extremists, not elections, that endanger our security. The adherence to democratic principles and respect for human rights cannot and should not always be the sole foreign policy goal for the U.S. and its bilateral relations with Egypt or any authoritarian ally. But issues of human rights have to be on the table more consistently. And high-level advocates for those positions should be present to make the case to decision makers in the White House. In fact, all parts of the U.S. government, not just state or U.S. aid, but the Defense Department, USTR, even the intelligence agencies should be asked to evaluate their actions and policies in terms of their potential to negatively or positively impact human rights. Assistance, trade, and security relationships should be leveraged to encourage the opening of political space and respect for human rights. And the U.S. should be a consistent voice for the right of all individuals to enjoy fundamental freedoms and not say that governments are, quote, on a democratic path when they clearly are not. We should back Egyptian civil society and human rights defenders, especially now as they test the waters and take risks. That support needs to be shown through diplomatic interactions, including public as well as private conversations. Sufficient resources for those on the front line should be made available in a way that does not endanger those who need it. We need to be willing to speak out when civic and human rights advocates and activists are repressed immediately and forcefully. And we need to provide legal and other emergency assistance to victims and their families, providing them safe transport and asylum if necessary. If the next administration can make that vision a reality, then indeed we will have transformed U.S. foreign policy and sent a signal that the U.S. is genuinely committed to freedom and human rights for all. Thank you, Jennifer. Ambassador Shaddock, you've served at the, the most senior levels of the State Department, and after listening to our first uh, three speakers, I'd love for you to reflect on what you think are the most important things a new administration can do to elevate human rights uh, on its agenda. Well, after listening to the first three speakers, it's like being the cleanup hitter after everyone's hit a home run. So it's really nobody on base, uh, so I'll try to uh, at least uh, do my part on this. It's a, it is a daunting uh, situation that we face, and I think what we've seen in this uh, three-country review, uh, particularly with respect to Egypt and Pakistan, is the sort of false construct between security and human rights, which is really, writ large, uh, the false construct, I think, that has uh, gripped our own country uh, for some time now, which is not in any way to diminish the security crisis that we face and that the world faces. But I think the top agenda item for the next administration is frankly going to, on human rights, is going to be getting our own house in order. Um, we're obviously living in a very paradoxical situation where the United States has unparalleled um, economic and military power, but uh, paradoxically probably has the lowest standing in the world that it's had for uh, many, many years. Um, the global uh, uh, statistics on, in terms of the uh, polling data are really extraordinary. If you go back to 1999, the U.S. had a, uh, a relatively favorable uh, rating across a wide variety of countries, Indonesia 75 percent, Turkey 52 percent, European countries generally high, and then uh, plummeted uh, in 2007 uh, so that uh, now only 29 percent of 18 countries that were surveyed by the BBC uh, had a favorable view of the U.S. role in the world, and 67 percent saw the U.S. as a violator of human rights. Uh, this is no longer news for us, but it, I think it's very important for us to absorb this as we look at what the next administration is going to have to do. Uh, 
The result is obviously a drastic loss of what uh, my good friend Joe Nye calls soft power, which is really the power to advance a human rights and democracy agenda through means other than coercion. Um, and I think there are sort of three fundamental rules that have been violated, which now need to be followed by the next administration. First is to practice what we preach. Um, if we're going to issue a human rights report annually, on countries around the world, as we do and have done for many years, we're certainly going to have to make sure that our own behavior on issues of interrogation and detention and the like is uh, in compliance with our own views of what other countries ought to be doing. We have to obey the law. It's a very simple uh, statement, but nonetheless one that I think uh, we often forget with respect to basic elements of law that have been incorporated into our own law, the Geneva Conventions, the International uh, uh, Treaty on Civil and Political Rights, uh, and a variety of other uh, international matters. Um, so what we have is, unfortunately, a, a severe undercutting of our own capacity to advance foreign policy objectives generally across the board in a wide variety of areas as a result of our own record uh, on human rights. And of course, Secretary Albright spoke of, about this. And let me just put forward a very um, straightforward agenda for what uh, the next president might do almost immediately uh, to begin to send signals uh, that the United States is back in the business of promoting in its own uh, in its own context to say nothing of around the world uh, human rights um, we should certainly uh, close Guantanamo and address the issues of uh, interrogation the restore habeas corpus comply with the Geneva conventions which are kind of items and it's very good to see that all three presidential candidates have generally agreed on this proposition. So I think that's an important point to put forward to begin with. We need to restate our commitment to human rights treaties and conventions that we have already ratified, like the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. We should re-sign the International Criminal Court Treaty, which was signed by President Clinton, and then be in, begin to be able to shape that institution in a way that will indeed be consistent with U.S. Uh, security interests and not simply stand outside of it. We should recommit ourselves to the, to the uh, responsibility to protect, which was an international doctrine developed uh, a number of years ago in the United Nations, with the United States very much behind it, uh, which is really the essential tool internationally for addressing crises like the one in Darfur, uh, et cetera. And then finally, I think we need to revamp, and this goes to many of the points made by my colleagues here are our ways of approaching democracy and human rights assistance. We need to lower the rhetoric uh, significantly uh, and increase the expertise and local uh, appeal of uh, particular forms of uh, democracy and human rights assistance so that it's consistent with what people actually are doing on the ground. We need to build local alliances with civil society elements. Uh, and we certainly need to, ref uh, to focus on how we might work with countries to reform particular sectors, say the security sector, for example, as a way of developing more uh, cross-sectoral influence in, in, in broad human rights areas such as the rule of law and the judiciary and police and the like. Uh, we certainly need to reorganize our own uh, governmental agencies that are involved in the delivery of this kind of assistance. Uh, we have a, uh, when we had this during the Clinton period, and this certainly persists today, very much in the Bush era, uh, a plethora of agencies that are often uh, c inconsistently addressing such basic elements as providing police training assistance and other forms of assistance that, that are so basic to all of this. Just a few words on, on each of the three countries and then, and then we'll go to your questions. Um, I agree very much with uh, Jim Sasser's uh, analysis that, that we know what doesn't work and hasn't worked particularly well with respect to China. And that's uh, a variety of different forms of attempted unilateral coercion. This was certainly attempted during the Clinton period with the uh, most favored nation status uh, effort to uh, link uh, 
human rights improvements to a, to a unilateral approach toward China. What's needed is a very multilateral connection on basic issues. Um, I think the using of the Olympics today is, uh, and, and working with Europeans that have uh, comparable concerns about what's happening in Tibet uh, as a way of drawing attention to some of the situation of human rights in China and being honest in the presentation of facts. I think I was very disappointed to see this administration has basically backed away from its uh, uh, characterization of China as a a major human rights violator, and that happened in the human rights report this year just before the uh, Tibet crisis broke, and uh, we all know what that, uh, that, what kind of hypocrisy that also indicates in terms of, of failure to be honest. So there are ways in which one can address the issues of human rights with a multilateral framework, uh, particularly working with other trade partners in, in, in within uh, in China, and I think the effort to assist on rule of law, China is very interested in improving its own legal institutions and finding ways and means of doing that. I think Pakistan, as Steve uh, Call has uh, quite rightly pointed out, probably is the most dramatic example of the false dichotomy between uh, or the construct of security versus human rights. Um, because I think here uh, what you have, and I'm by no means an expert on Pakistan, but taking his analysis, uh, what, what you have is a situation where uh, we have, uh, as a result of coming down very hard on the security side and shortchanging those internally who are engaged in reform, we've created uh, an isolation of our own policy so that it isn't uh, part of what ultimately will be a connection between the stability of Pakistan long term and its developing democratic uh, process. So we need to rebalance uh, our assistance, and the same is certainly true with respect to Egypt uh, in terms of, of uh, much more effectively using that extraordinary amount of assistance that goes to Egypt from the United States uh, to support uh, those who are engaged in the efforts to uh, change the uh, situation on the ground with respect to democracy and human rights. So let me just stop there, and uh, there's a Great. large world out there that I'm sure everybody else is going to want to talk about as well. Great. I, I wanted to start out our discussion uh, with, with a couple of questions. I think one common thread in all of the presentations is the notion that actions speak louder than words, that what we can do practically um, matters a lot. But I do want to ask about words. I'd love to hear uh, from the ambassadors or uh, from the other panelists on what their advice would be to the next president and other senior officials about how they talk about human rights and democracy. Because we've had a president under President Bush, it's hard to find a national security speech uh, that he's given that does not mention the forward freedom agenda or pr the promotion of democracy. And Jennifer, you talked about Secretary Rice's speech um, in Egypt. And, and I want to raise this not because uh, it's as important as, as the actions that we undertake, but how would you advise, given this notion and I think a common thread that we need to correct some of these mistakes, how should the next administration, its leadership, talk about these issues? Should they talk about it as much as the Bush administration did? Um, Ambassador Shaddock, you said we should lower the rhetoric. What exactly does that mean um, in, in each of these countries? And is it useful in certain instances for, to have senior officials calling out some of the, some of the most important abuses? Because I think it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult question for the next administration to address. Well, let me, let me take a, a first stab at this. I think it's a, it is a difficult question, but it, it's a question that, is, that can be answered. Um, because there are various ways of using uh, diplomatic uh, pressures, including uh, reports of the kind that the United States and other governments have issued on human rights, um, and making those public and uh, honestly assessing uh, the facts. Uh, I'll remember very much when the decision was made to delink uh, human rights from most favored nation status. I and Winston Lord and the State Department fought very hard and, and won internally the battle to make sure that we called the situation exactly what it was. In other words, that the President Clinton and others in announcing this delinkage were not changing the analysis of uh, the facts that we had analyzed about uh, how bad the, the situation was in particular areas on human rights. Um, 
On the other hand, uh, there, there are times when you can be much more effective working uh, behind the scenes. Uh, and I think uh, you can operate uh, with uh, diplomatic pressures uh, which are that much stronger because they are not uh, being made public in some situations. But in the public broad context, what would a president say and what would the speech look like? I think the speech um, that I would have the next president deliver uh, would start and, and in fact go all the way through the international framework of human rights that, uh, that the United States is working in. This is not a unilateral matter. This is not something that the United States is pursuing uh, in its own uh, uh, self-interest, although we certainly have a strong self-interest in pursuing hu human rights. But there is a framework which I think uh, we have abandoned, particularly over the last eight years, but to some extent we haven't adequately embraced it over all presidents. Uh, and it's a framework of international law uh, and a framework of multilateral action and a framework of international institutions. And it's within that framework that there should be an understanding uh, of the U.S. commitment to human rights. And we ourselves, of course, need to comply, uh, as I said in my remarks with, with uh, with many of the legal requirements of that fr framework? Um, well, I would just say that I, uh, presidential proclamations on democracy, human rights, and freedom are fundamentally important. And I think that President Bush should be congratulated for that. And just because he's in favor and did that doesn't mean that the next president should not. Let's raise the bar, not lower the rhetoric. Um, the, the signals that it sends to people all over the world, no matter what the uh, anti-American is, anti-American sentiment is, um, is very, very important. And I've heard that from all over the world. Um, and, but you know, also let's be careful with the language in the sense that let's not laud elections as uh, democratic breakthroughs. Let's not call people Democrats when they're not. Um, okay. I also think it's very critical on the issue of providing assistance that we understand that a lot of these groups cannot publicly say they want any assistance. They will, in fact, very, very outspokenly denounce assistance. And we should not make the determination for them that we are endangering them. We should work to make sure the mechanisms are good ones and that we consult with them on the best way to do so. Finally, on the issue of the international framework, I couldn't agree more. However, we have to be very aware that right now the international framework on human rights is under more attack now than ever before. And yes, the U.S. government plays a role in that, but the real perpetrators, those that are trying to actually turn back decades of agreement on what international human rights laws are and the universality of those laws, such as freedom of expression, it's not the U.S. The U.S. is unfortunately not at the table, but it's the Russians, it's the Pakistanis, it's the Egyptians. Uh, the Human Rights Council has just recently passed restrictions on freedom of expression that are mind-blowing in the name of the protection of religious diversity. But we're not even at the table. And if the next administration does not address this, we're going to be sitting here in 10 years and talk about actually how multilateral institutions are not the answer. They're the weapons of the dictators. Thanks, Jennifer. Yeah, just two quick comments. One is, I think, as John said, it's very important to de-Americanize the language and rhetoric about human rights because the um, aspirations that the United States can and should support, particularly in the developing, in the South, are no longer seen by those aspirants as American um, in character or even Western in character. They, they're seen as Southern in character in the North-South context. And the United States ought to find language that advances emphatically its own ideals, but recognizes that those are not uh, sort of fundamentally American in character. And I think that's a real weakness of the current administration's language. And the other point that I would make is that the United States talks, uh, certainly this administration emphasizes freedom over justice. 
in its rhetorical choices. And I think that's a, a, a correctable error. Um, that for the experience of the conditions that we might associate with a freedom agenda are often experienced, particularly in troubled societies, as, as issues closer to justice than, than choice. And uh, the United States has not been able to develop an international language about uh, equality of access and uh, freedom from state violence that is recognized by the listeners to such rhetoric as consistent with their own justice agenda. And I think that's something that the next president can, can find language to do. Well, I'd just like to echo what Steve just said. I think that this, that, that this business of always talking about freedom really goes back to, that, that's an old uh, saw that goes back before the Cold War. And it really, I think, has no residence now. And we ought to be talking about justice and equity and not so much about freedom. And I think the next president should enunciate a strong position on human rights. But I do not think it ought to be directed specifically at any particular government. Now, for example, I, in, in my view, you, you make a lot more progress based on my experience with the Chinese uh, by not humiliating them, or the, what they perceive to be humiliation publicly. Uh, uh, enunciate a doctrine that does not go directly to any particular country, but then diplomatically, discreetly, uh, uh, discuss these matters with the offending government. Uh, now, my, in my experience with the Chinese, I found that they very much wanted to have international prestige. And they want to conform to what they perceive to be certain international standards. The leaders of China are very sensitive, uh, at least during, in my experience, to going abroad and be subjected to demonstrations uh, directed against them because of human rights violations. So if you, uh, if you use, as I said earlier, the, the tool of, of sort of friendly persuasion, uh, I think that works better uh, sometimes at a direct affront which also uh, raises uh, sort of the nationalistic uh, hackles of, of, of the general population. And they can say to us, or the Chinese could say to us, why do you direct your human rights uh, accusations against us? What about Saudi Arabia? What about Egypt? What about Israel and the Palestinian question? So it needs to be general and not specific, and it needs to be a constant pressure of friendly persuasion, in my judgment. And the first thing we've got to do is to clean our own house and set an example for human rights around the world uh, and, and realize that uh, much of the world sees us as being hypocritical, and we need to correct that hypocrisy. Brian, can I just make one final sure. uh, comment? Is it? <laughs> There's an elephant in the room. We haven't addressed it, and it's time to do that briefly. Um, and that is uh, the rhetoric of human rights and democracy has been perverted because it has come through the barrel of a gun. And so much of the world sees it that way now. And until we make clear that that is not our view of how democracy, and whether or not we actually believe that, I don't think it is the view of most Americans that democracy can be delivered through the barrel of a gun. But uh, Iraq has certainly changed the perception of the world on that. So uh, when it comes to rhetoric, this is probably the very first thing that a president is going to have to say. And uh, I'm not sure that all the candidates would agree on that one. Certainly uh, one of them, the Republican candidate, probably wouldn't. Thanks. Thanks, John. Uh, going back to action, and I just wanted to ask one more question, because Jennifer, Steve, you talked about the different things that different agencies do, in particular in Pakistan. We have a strong program with the Pakistani military there. And going back to the barrel of the gun, is there anything that we can do in our mill-to-mill -mill or intel-to-intel -intel cooperation to advance the human rights agenda, as unrealistic as that may seem? Because I've noted that it's not for lack of having agencies like the U.S. Agency for International 
international development or non-governmental groups that focus on human rights and democracy. But are there things, even small adjustments we can make um, in the realm of perhaps conditioning aid or trying to engender better practices among different security services um, in, in these countries? Is that realistic to, to, to address? Uh, yes, I think it's realistic to address. I think, again, you'd be proceeding from a position of trying to recover from policies that have sort of embedded themselves in the mill-to-mill -mill and intelligence liaison relationships over the last six or seven years that you would have to make clear you wanted to change. So then you would first have to be willing to talk in pragmatic terms with your partners about what the consequences of that change would be for the way they managed detention policy, the way they managed kinetic strikes in the tribal areas on a unilateral basis and so forth. But there are ways in which um, you could decide what change you were prepared to embrace and then in the privacy of the mill-to-mill -mill and intelligence liaisons try to insist on that over a gradual period of time. I think if the next administration walked into these liaisons and said, oh, by the way, you know, we've had a eureka moment here in the United States, and everything that you have done together with your professional civil service uniform partners in the last six years, we now repudiate. That won't be a constructive way to proceed. But you could construct a vision of a two to three year program in which a potential hammer, and this was true in the Egyptian relationship in the 90s, would be the private conditioning of covert aid inside the closed sphere of a, of a security cooperation relationship. Because if you take that public, uh, in, certainly in the, in the Pakistani context, you're, you're really asking for, uh, for a, a reaction that's much more debilitating than the gains that you would make through the conditioning. But there is some, I think, conditioning available just between us um, mm -hmm. that, that can prove the, the seriousness of a, of a liaison agenda. Um, I, I'm not an expert on this, but I would say that um, I know there's human rights training in military and security assistance, IMED, et cetera. But I think there's two issues. One is um, that have been really underplayed that we should look at. One is actually uh, encouraging civilian knowledge and interaction with the military as part of that. Right now, our military deals with their military. And I think actually figuring out ways to sort of bring democracy and civilian interaction with the military would be very important for us to look at. Um, it is same thing with police reform. There's some very interesting work going on um, in terms of community level police reform and um, and trying to uh, encourage NGOs at the local level to uh, to interact with the police. So again, not just having you know a Department of Justice police training uh, completely segregated from everything else. And I think that, that we have yet to really achieve that kind of programmatic integration on the ground. And therefore, I think it, it's, it, they, they sometimes work at cross purposes. I will say that um, in our military, of course, one of the things that we try to emphasize is professionalism and unity. Um, in the case of Zimbabwe right now, what we're looking for is disunity, right? We're trying to actually get security forces to, to in fact disobey. So I think we need to look at how our military trains in non-democratic countries, because in this case, we the future of Zimbabwe depends on Robert Mugabe losing control of the security forces. Great, thank you. I think our panelists this morning have done their job and uh, piqued everybody's curiosity here. I'd like to open it up to questions, starting first with Melody Barnes, who is the uh, Executive Vice, Vice President uh, at the Center for American Progress. Great. Whoa. Thank you, Brian, and thanks to the members of the panel. I'd like to start out by asking a question that touches on one of the com uh, countries that Ambassador Sasser just mentioned, and that's Saudi Arabia and America's very complex relationship with that country. And national security and economic concerns like around oil and Iran and Iraq have really bound our countries together. At the same time, there are very serious human rights concerns, um, political detention, torture, a dearth of human rights watchdog organizations in country. And I'm wondering, in terms of the next administration, how do we manage that relationship? What would progress look like there, an indicia of progress, and what should we be thinking about in terms of success and realistic elements of success in terms of going forward? Who would like to take that easy question? 
Okay. All right, I'll, I'll <laughs> thank you, you panelists. Um, <laughs> Isn't John Stewart coming up? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the Bush administration attempted to use uh, the most forceful human rights language directed at Saudi Arabia that any administration has used. And I was there when much of this uh, rhetoric was being offered. And I have to say, it did have an effect on the middle class urban based reformers who were desperate for what little bit of political oxygen might be available in the Saudi context. And I remember in particular in uh, the State of the Union speech in 2005, which was the big democracy agenda speech, and the president called on Egypt as the fountain of Arab civilization to lead the way to dem democracy, and then, and then he called on Saudi Arabia to quicken the pace of its reforms, I think, something along those lines. And the next morning I was in Riyadh, ran into some royal retainers, and they said, how dare he single us out, call us out, we're going to make him pay for that. This is not how you treat your friends. And then that evening I went to a Diwani, or those young sort of democracy groups in Saudi Arabia, and they all said, Egypt's the cradle of civilization, they get democracy, we get quick in the pace of our reforms, what is this? So, uh, it's, you know, essentially the United States is in it, has a, has a, a no-win proposition. There is no way uh, in the current geopolitical context that the Saudi royal family is going to be pressured from below uh, to reform. But I don't think that American rhetoric about these issues uh, is irrelevant. The, the, the pressures of reform that will ultimately shape events in Saudi Arabia will occur in a regional context. They're already happening in the UAE. They're happening in the Gulf, in the smaller Gulf states. They'll happen elsewhere in the Arab world. They're happening in Lebanon. And because of satellite television and other factors, they influence Saudi Arabia. So I think in the end, it's an outside-in approach uh, that is the most effective one, but taking no steps in the bilateral that is inconsistent uh, or hypocritical in that, in that sort of regional approach. Um, I would just uh, say, first of all, um, I think we have to be honest about what the Saudis are doing and um, uh, the and not sort of say that everything is fixed. Uh, I just mentioned the presence of extremist um, language in religious curriculums that are used all over the world and the impact that that has in terms of our future. I think we really, really need to get serious with the Saudi government on that issue. I will say that um, I'm not a Saudi expert, but I've had the opportunity over the last several weeks to meet with a number of extraordinary Saudi women. And I feel like they are such a talented group that they are making inroads, and uh, we have to be there to support them. Uh, they had a great exchange here a few weeks back with Sandra Day O'Connor, some of the uh, sort of leaders in uh, Saudi um, legal, women in the legal profession, and uh, they just participated in a regional conference on family law reform that was held in Kuwait. And I, I see a real ferment, a real discussion there Let's figure out how to not endanger it, but to encourage it. Uh, so I don't think it's uh, move along the, the reform. I don't think there's going to be explosion. But I think that, again, we, we have to continue to support uh, people on the ground that are trying to push for reform. And you know, it's a very complex scene. So they know best how to navigate. Uh, through the shoals that are quite dangerous in that society, but I think there's some interesting currents. So I would hope the next administration would think creatively about how to, how to help those currents. Can I just say, I think that she's absolutely right. Gender and tolerance and pluralism are the three points of entry into Saudi Arabia, but they're also regional points yeah. of entry, and uh, and that is, that's a low-cost uh, strategy also. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have many questions here, and um, if you could please just state your uh, name and affiliation, if you could share it with the audience, and then uh, give us a question. And we'll try to get through all of these, and if you'd like to direct your question to a particular panel member, please do so. Thanks. Uh, Charlie Brown, uh, Occam Advisors. Um, John, you spoke of uh, one of the elephants in the room, and that is uh, trying to institute human rights or democracy at the end of the gun. I would argue there are several elephants in the room. Another one is the fact that for all our talk about friendly persuasion and confidence building, uh, the reality is the rest of the world has lost confidence in us, and uh, that we have uh, a lot more work to do than merely taking action such as rejoining the, the UN Human Rights Council re-signing uh, the, uh, the ICC. 
That's problem number one. Problem number two, or elephant number three, I guess if you could say, uh, is that um, there is an emergence of a body of law in the United States and legal theories in the United States which are arguing that we, have, we don't, don't have to respect uh, human rights law, international human rights law. I speak not only of the Military Commissions Act, but of the recent Medellin case, uh, and of arguments, uh, the, U the U memos in particular. And last but not least, to kind of wrap those up in a bow, what would you advise the next administration when a judge in Spain or Belgium attempts to prosecute a Rumsfeld, a U, uh, an Addington, uh, for violations? of international law? Great question. Charlie, that's a brilliant uh, summation of all the various, I'm not sure that we've got the right type of animal. That seems unf <laughs> unfair. Uh, but there are certainly some, some large and at this point still unspoken uh, problems, and you've spoken to several of them. Um, I, I, you know, I think the, uh, to take your last one first in a way, um, <clears throat> I feel relatively comfortable with uh, the re-signing of the International Criminal Court Treaty uh, and bringing the United States into a position where it can begin to reshape uh, to some extent, as it was doing when we were unceremoniously unsigned, uh, reshape uh, that institution. And I, I'm, um, you know, I think what an American president can say with respect to any inquiry that comes from a foreign court or otherwise with respect to uh, uh, an American uh, policymaker, popular as, or unpopular as he or she may be, is that uh, the International Criminal Court recognizes a, a system of complementarity whereby our own, if there is any allegation that is made, if we are able to investigate it in good faith ourselves, uh, the International Criminal Court has no jurisdiction over it. And if it's, if it's a foreign government, um, obviously there's no way we can control what a foreign government may do. This has nothing really to do with the International Criminal Court. It has to do with, the, with what a foreign government may seek to do to prosecute someone uh, in their own uh, country. Uh, so that's not, uh, that, that, that is not specifically a matter before the President. But the larger question, I think, of, of, of the loss of credibility and how it is restored um, is one that I think is going to preoccupy uh, the next administration for far longer than the short period that I was outlining in terms of things that can be done right away. There are some very important symbolic things to be done right away, and I named some of them. Um, but I think the way in which more broadly we go about pursuing our national interests and objectives um, is going to uh, determine whether we have credibility. And there are some basic things that uh, I think we, <clears throat> without necessarily saying that we'll never do them, we should never do. This goes to the proposition of uh, actions speak louder than words, as we've said in some, some, uh, some aspects of what the panel is discussing. Um, I think uh, certainly uh, we should never pursue the delivery of democracy in a, f in a, in a unilateral uh, and military context the way uh, we have done so in Iraq. We have seen that that is uh, a disaster. That is not, uh, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm saying here is, has nothing to do with what we do now in Iraq. That's a, that's a different set of policy issues, but certainly going in that way. Uh, I think we also need to be much more attentive to alliances and to international institutions uh, than we have been over the last eight years. And that will, those actions uh, will speak uh, loudly when we work with others to pursue objectives, particularly in human rights areas. We've, we've talked about China, we talk about Darfur, et cetera. Um, but those, those kind of, that, that approach, which will be the approach, I would hope, of the next administration, will slowly and steadily rebuild credibility, but it's not going to happen overnight. Great. Thank you. Next question over here. Uh, Marwan Malouf, I'm a master flow student here. I have uh, just a question about the Middle East. Uh, first of all, as a person coming from the Middle East, the 
the criticism, the criticize and the failure of the administration and even non-governmental organization in the Middle East started 10 years and even go beyond the Bush administration. So I think we should not only focus on criticizing the Bush administration, okay, the worst administration, but the failure started beyond this administration. And the great example is to give that all the Arab countries are really similar, ha have facing the same problems, Tunisia, Egypt, Syria, Jordan, and Lebanon, for example. And even when they had a good intention of making a real change in the Arab world, for example, in Lebanon, because they, there is no the know-how how to do it, there was a failure. So I think we should also focus more on even when there is a good intention of an administration or of non-governmental organization in the Middle East, there is a big failure, or for example, to whom to give the grants mm -hmm. for real change, to whom to give, to whom to give uh, uh, big funds for organization, local organization in the Middle East. Because for example, in Lebanon, we, are, we didn't expect any more support from Europe, from the US, from everyone was speaking about mm -hmm. Lebanon, the change, democracy, human rights, and as, as we can see now, we are worse than when the Syrian was occupying Lebanon. So it's not only talk or addressing the question of human rights, I think it's also to know with whom to deal in the Middle mm -hmm. East and how to deal with the Middle East. So it's, mm -hmm. so it's not only Does question. anyone strongly agree or disagree with that? Mm -hmm. Jennifer? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. I think um, uh, every time I enter any country, but I can say particularly the Middle East, trying to figure out the answer of who to talk to and where they're coming from, it makes my head hurt. Um, so I think that uh, any NGO or government official makes mistakes when they try to act in a hasty fashion. And they also come with preconceived notions, and they don't really listen. And uh, I, you know, sometimes groups and individuals that talk in the language that Americans, for instance, understand, or human rights groups understand, that. That, that might be just language. So um, anyway, I think that the one thing that I've learned in trying to work on democracy and human rights, both from the government and the NGO, is a little humility is in order and a lot of listening. Um, I still can't guarantee that that's going to work because it's very, very difficult, obviously, to come in from the outside. And you can be guided by the people inside, but who you're guided by is sometimes hard to you know, hard to figure out, and it could change um, very rapidly. So, um, so I, I I take your point. Great, thank you, ma'am. Maria Claudia Spindola, I am a consultant. I would like to ask a question to Ambassador Saucer. Although you haven't mentioned Latin America, I would like to know if it's possible, how should the United States address the issue of human rights in Colombia? In the research we have done, we have been encouraged to empower vulnerable communities, uh, working with multisectorial programs, engaging private sector governmental organizations, the academy, and of course the organizations of the civil society. Most of these vulnerable communities are very poor. Thank you for inviting me to this event. Thank you. Mm. Well, I certainly am not any expert on Colombia. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure precisely how to answer that, that question, but I do think that um, I think over a period of many, many decades, uh, the United States government under many administrations has not been as sensitive or as responsible on the question of human rights uh, in Latin America as it should have been. Uh, I think now um, uh, we have a new opportunity with the emergence, as I see it, uh, in South America and Latin America of governments that are more democratically oriented than they have been in times past. And I think a new administration and a new president uh, should give great emphasis emphasis uh, to encouraging democracy, human rights, uh, justice, and particularly economic justice uh, south of the border and in South America. I have often thought that one of the great failures of American foreign policy over many, many, many decades has been the uh, our 
a policy of generally ignoring South America or, or countries south of the border until something arises there that we think perhaps threatens our economic interest and then we will intervene in a way which in many cases has not been uh, something that we can we can look back on with pride uh, but to answer your question specifically about uh, Colombia perhaps other members of the panel would be better qualified than I am for that no Colombia experts well I mean I it, I think you, one observation you can make in the light of recent events is that um, even intractable conflicts eventually uh, begin to yield to sustained pressure and sustained organizing of the sort that you're doing. And you can see this in the circumstances of the FARC today. And, and I think that it's a reminder that, you know, we sometimes give up on these narratives uh, and, and, the, and the ideals of the people who are caught up in these wars. Mm -hmm. And, and we, we often uh, are reminded later that we've given up prematurely, that those on the ground have always had in mind a vision of an outcome mm -hmm. um, that might take them some time to get, get to, but which um, they, they need our support uh, in a sort of more stalwart way than we often deliver it. Thank you. Okay. you. Ma'am. I'm Rachel Dash, and first I want to thank everyone for planning this. Um, I see my dad, and it's, there's no better way to honor him. Um, I'm on the faculty of West Virginia University Medical School, and as a mental health professional, I'm a sy family systems therapist, and I work with trauma and torture victims. And one step in, in recovery and in change is to provide a vocal witness to the trauma and to many unrecognized activities of resistance. So I wanted to ask, how do, you how do you think we should balance the need for quiet diplomacy, so not to humiliate governments, with also the need to provide hope and support for brave human rights activists wherever our world leaders are, whether it's um, down south in our own country, um, in a, speaking at what used to be a plantation and now is a resort, um, around slavery or to the Olymp if they're in the Olympic Village, which we've learned recently um, was forcibly evacuated of many of the people who live there, uh, their homes destroyed in order to create space for the Olympic Village. So it's how do you balance those two things? Um, how can we be there but not as leaders voice what's going on? Okay. Thank you. Sir? Well, I guess the question is, um, how do you balance sort of the real politic uh, with human rights? And that is a very, very difficult question, and one that we see our government has tried to balance uh, in China, in Saudi Arabia, and many other countries. And quite frankly, the real politic equation uh, generally uh, wins out. Uh, what we view is our strategic uh, security interest or economic interest in the final analysis uh, uh, takes precedent uh, over human rights. And perhaps um, uh, this is going to be a, a balancing act that we're going to see for a long, long, long time. Uh, but I'm an optimist, and I really think if you look at the long push of history, or just the push of recent history, that human rights has become much more uh, important uh, to governments around the world. And human rights, I think, are much more at the forefront than they have been at, in many times in the past. Uh, one of my great regrets, and we've talked about this here on this panel uh, uh, endlessly, is the loss of credibility of the United States which historically, at least uh, in the 20th century and before, has been one of the great champions of human rights. And we've got to restore that. And uh, I think that we can move forward uh, in, in, in giving the question of human rights more weight in the balance between sort of what I call the real politic and human rights in conjunction with other nations. I think the European Union really now, it appears to me, has been taking the, the, uh, the uh, lead in human rights over the past, past few years. 
And I'd like to see the United States and the European Union and perhaps the government of Japan and other countries that have some sense of human rights uh, banding together and r really pressing forward with it. But to answer your question about how do you decide in Saudi Arabia if you want the oil or if you want the human rights, or how do you decide in China if you want, do you want uh, uh, the trade with China and the economic uh, um, uh, intercourse with China and balance that against the human rights? Uh, that is a very, very difficult question. I think my question was more how to balance seeking out the different fiat at the global village. Do they just act like they're not going to be Can, can I uh, give a, a, oh, I'm sorry, Jennifer, did you? No, please. I was just going to say that this is nothing new in China for the Chinese to move in and take over the Olympic Village. I mean, they've been, they've been, if you read the newspapers, this has been going on for a long, long time before they, before they, before they took over the Olympics. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, just a very quick response. And first, uh, great admiration for your father. Sam Dash was one of the giants of the rule of law in, uh, in the period when I began as a lawyer in the early 1970s. So I, we're, I think we should all be honored here to be here uh, at, this, at this conference, which is in many ways about the rule of law internationally. Uh, how do you make these decisions? Um, I, uh, my sense, uh, and this is, I'm now wearing my hat as Assistant Secretary of State for Human Rights, it, it got a little more complicated when I became an ambassador. I was responsible for all aspects of our foreign policy in a country. But uh, I, I think um, we owe it to all those uh, struggling activists around the world uh, never to hide the facts, never to shy away from uh, speaking the truth. That does not mean that we will put pressure on a government in an economic or, worse yet, military coercive sense uh, unless there is a very broad set of national interests that are at stake. But I think w the United States, if it is to restore its credibility on human rights, has to restore its ability to be able to speak truth uh, to its own power and to uh, other powers and, and to do so in a, in a respectful, but clear fashion, um, so that with the, the facts and the and the and the abuses as people are feeling them on the ground, are indeed recognized uh, officially. Um, <clears throat> I think we also have to get beyond thinking about governments and what we as individuals can do. Um, so we, um, I'm part of a group of called the Human Rights Leadership Coalition. Many of the people are in the room, and. Um, we talked about ways that athletes or visitors to the games could um, appropriately, without humiliating the Chinese, perhaps wear something, maybe the logo for the 60th anniversary of the Declaration of Human Rights uh, as a, a badge or an armband. It's not going to be objectionable, but it would send a signal. Um, I also think specifically, I just want to say uh, in my current job, we've had the opportunity to work with torture trauma centers, and I think they're extraordinarily important. Um, and the Center for Victims of Torture and the various torture treatment centers around the United States do important work, and I don't see, you know, there is a bill and some funding to establish these. Uh, again, this is a way that uh, giving assistance in this regard is not a high diplomatic um, affront. You're just helping uh, torture victims to talk through uh, what they have individually suffered. So I don't think it needs to be uh, a major, you know, trade-off between stability and economic issues. And then I also just want to recognize um, that there there needs to be an ongoing recognition of the impact of psychological torture, as well as other forms of torture, and the work of Physicians for Human Rights, I think, in identifying this, and as well as the center and others, uh, I think we really need to, to keep this focus on, and I think we can do a lot of work, obviously, not only in our own uh, <laughs> detention and interrogation policies, but in providing services all around the world. Great, thank you. The hour is running late. What I'd like to do is ask you to ask your question. We'll take them two at a time, and we'll try to wrap up as quickly as possible. So you first, and you, sir. OK, my name is Bishoy Lamy. I am from Egypt and um, doing master participation power social change in UK. Uh, 
Um, I have similar question to Marwan ones, which is during uh, the presidential election in Egypt last time, um, we found that the Islamic Brotherhood had the lead in it. So the question comes again, uh, US uh, provide many grants in Egypt, uh, and I am worried that some of these grants go, uh, goes to the Islamic Brotherhood. Uh, we don't need the solution of a problem to be another problem. This is one thing. <laughs> I just recall um, uh, um, uh, recall a meeting with the leader of the Islamic Brotherhood in Egypt. He said, frankly, in the front of the <coughs> national TV, uh, first thing I will do, I will destroy the f uh, fifth, uh, back to the 50 years the church has built in the last 50 years. So I'm as a Coptic in Egypt. I would not welcome something like this to be the president of Egypt. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Sir. Uh, George Lopez, the Kroc Institute at the University of Notre Dame, and fortunate to be a chapter author on the book. Many of you talked well about the false dichotomy between security and human rights. Would a positive human rights assertion by the next administration be to declare the war on terror over and leave us to the boring, terrible, but effective use of law enforcement, intelligence, and other things, uh, which also reinforce the rule of law as a way to also deal with counterterrorism. Great. Thank you. Jennifer, do you want to take the Egypt question first, and then uh, whomever would like to address the broader question? Listen, I, <clears throat> you know, there's a lot of debates about the Muslim Brotherhood, and there's no doubt that the Muslim Brotherhood and elements of it have a vision in their platform that where human rights uh, for all is not guaranteed. So while they've, uh, as a group, uh, skewed violence, uh, I think it remains to be seen whether they're truly committed to democracy and human rights. Um, the question, I think, is whether they would, in fact, continue to have the lead um, if they were given opportunities to have to, as they say, clean up the garbage. It's a little hard to find. Um, uh, sort of regular um, guidance from that in the Quran or the Hadith. And uh, we're certainly seeing in a lot of other cases that, that that's really what governing is about. Um, so, but I agree with you that uh, respect for religious minorities um, and other elements has to be there. The, the question is if they are simply repressed and the government is not delivering any social and economic justice to its citizens and other options are systematically repressed, we are basically paving the way for the Muslim Brotherhood to be the only opposition that's viable and they will continue to gain ground and uh, they in particular find fertile ground uh, in prisons where people are in prison for demonstrating peacefully and it's a great place to uh, adopt a new ideology about the way things really have to change and that ideology is a scary one for all of us. Ambassador Sasser. Well uh, on the question of uh, giving up on the war on terror as a veteran of the uh, war on poverty and the war on cancer <laughs> and the war on drugs and numerous other wars in my lifetime I I think we ought to give up on the war on terror and return it to the intelligence and policing uh, operation that it really is. And uh, you recall that that became, I think, an issue in the campaign in 2004 when Senator Kerry indicated early on, perhaps in a Senate speech, uh, before becoming a candidate, that it was more of a policing and an intelligence issue than a military issue. And uh, that came back to haunt him politically. But I remember the ridiculous, uh, on the 9-11, after the Twin Towers were hit, the religious, uh, the, the ridiculous uh, reaction we had in some, in some ways, sending a carrier battle group from Florida up towards New York City, as if a nuclear aircraft carrier and its accompanying ships could be any help. Uh, in uh, the problem, uh, in, in the tragedy of the war on terror. So I just say yes, I agree with you that uh, it needs, it's a policing action, an intelligence action, and we don't need any, any more wars. We've got enough, we've got the war in Iraq is enough. Great. Thank you. Now, we have three more questions, and I, I must warn you, I'm being threatened with, uh, with my lunch being taken away from me. This threat extends to you, too. <laughs> so the three questioners, if you could keep it brief, we'll try to wrap it up and, and sum up the session. 
I'm going to have to leave before lunch, so sorry the threat doesn't work. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm Regan Ralph. I'm the executive director of the Fund for Global Human Rights, and I wanted to pick up on a theme that Secretary Albright identified first in her opening statement, and then I think all of the panelists um, touched on this to some extent, and that has to do with what is desirable and possible for the U.S. to do through its foreign policy and assistance when it comes to supporting civil society. Um, I think, uh, you know, everybody spoke about the fact that civil society is critical to getting to rights respecting societies, promoting democracy, good governance, and accountability. But there's a history here, which means that many organizations, and my, my group supports human rights groups directly all over the world, um, see the hypocrisy of rhetoric on the one hand and the actions of the U.S. government on the other hand and feel like the combination of those two things has left them more marginalized and more vulnerable than they started out. Great. So the question is, what is desirable and possible for the U.S. to do through its assistance to support civil society organizations? Great. Thank you. Ma'am? You touched a little bit on my question, which is the issue of gender, and uh, talked about uh, how that has been playing out in Saudi Arabia. If we look at Iran, certainly there's a role there in Kuwait and Qatar as well. But in other aspects of, of the world, women, whether it's in Africa or in Latin America, the role that they are playing as agents of change. Also, the role that they're playing in, in uh, advancements on human rights. The United States, as you know, has not ratified the Treaty for the Rights of Women. There is legislation pending uh, that is one avenue for helping women on international violence against women specifically, but there are many other initiatives as well. Could you talk a little bit about the role of women in the context of human rights and transition, but also uh, about what the United States should do? Last question. Yeah, hi. Aaron Zisser, uh, I'm the Kroll Family Human Rights Fellow at Human Rights First and a Georgetown Law Center alum. Um, and this question is directed at, at Steve Cole specifically. So if you want to take it up with John Stewart tomorrow that instead, that would be fine. Um, but the, the question is also relevant to you because of your experience as a journalist. Um, and and it's, uh, forgive the two-part question. Um, I've been really interested in uh, how attentive the Pakistani media, the English language media in particular, has been to everything the United States or the Senate or anybody on the Hill, um, everything they have to say on the question of judicial independence in Pakistan. Um, they covered Negroponte's testimony almost word for word with respect to the judiciary there. Um, and the United States continue, or the United States government continues to ignore the fact that the Pakistani public is therefore very much privy to our position and is being alienated, and that we're alienating the Pakistani public as a result. I, I wonder if uh, the question is: is is that is the government aware of that, and is it just part of the equation of the security versus human rights um, balance? And the second question is. Um, uh, about the U.S. media, um, the United. Uh, one thing that happened during that hearing with Negroponte was that uh, Senator Feingold brought up a report about U.S. interference pressuring the Pakistani leadership against reinstatement of the judges. That was in an obscure McClatchy Newswire report. Um, the New York Times did a little bit on it, but um, no one res no one reported on Feingold's. A reference to, to those reports, and I'm curious as to why, from your perspective, and if I'm wrong, please correct me, but why the U.S. media has not followed up very thoroughly on reports of U.S. Um, pressure against reinstatement and have, have instead only referred to the U.S. silence on, on reinstatement. Thank you. Great. We have three simple, quick, easy questions. <laughs> As quickly as possible, um, perhaps starting with civil society. Jennifer, maybe? or um, Well, in just a few minutes. Um, I don't think that the U.S. government assistance should be restricted just to government institutions. I think one of the things that the U.S. government has learned is that you have to integrate civil society into such government strengthening programs. Uh, I can point to many, many mistakes that the various U.S. government agencies have done with civil society, uh, micromanagement and uh, attempts to sort of control outcomes and pick winners and to only listen to groups that speak our language and not think about local connections. Um, obviously, I uh, will now sound biased in the sense that I think that NGOs have an important role to play 
um, in in linking with civil society on the ground, and that uh, that we should have maximum autonomy in terms of coming up with uh, those relationships, and that our purpose in that should be to try to actually uh, get out of there, except for in symbolic, and, and so that these groups can actually get assistance directly, maybe not from the U.S. government, but to increase their capacity. Uh, that's it. But I'll tell you, I'm quite um, concerned about uh, the partner vetting system, which is some arcane thing that you've never even heard of, but it's basically a uh, checking system that's occurring in all U.S. government grants that's going to be put in place that they will require an extensive amount of information from civil society groups on the ground that I think will mean that the U.S. government will play itself out of the civil society assistance business. Um, so I can also address the Saudi issue um, and the role of women. I, I can't agree with you more, Alex. I mean, I was, we, I was at this uh, family law reform uh, program as a speaker, and the first question to me was, what is the U.S. doing trying to foster women's rights in the Middle East when you haven't uh, ratified CEDAW? And, uh, and then they reminded me that, and you did too, that Iran and North Korea are among the other countries that haven't ratified CEDAW. So that's a very interesting group. Um, and I do see women, and you know, the ten, the, this administration tends to focus on women in the Middle East, but it's true, women across uh, the world have been in the forefront of change. Unfortunately, what it usually happens is that they push for change, and then when elections are held, the men take over. Sorry, guys, but, um, and they get sort of pushed to the background, and so they're still trying to make up, I think, in terms uh, of losses in political participation and representation, I would say, in this country as well. We have uh, some work to do in terms of acceptance of that. Uh, I do want to talk about um, domestic violence, which I think is unifying for everybody, and to publicly support uh, this legislation of international violence against women that I know that you and a number of groups have done so much for. I think that this is the kind of thing that the new administration put in place immediately. Steve? Um, I do think the Bush administration is reluctant to see the Chief Justice restored because of its concerns that he will undermine security operations. So I think that is an empirical uh, truth. And as to the media, I think it's uh, a subject that, that the Times and others have done generally well on. But since this is more or less an undeclared policy in, set in the murk of post-electoral maneuvering in Pakistan. Um, it'll take some time to, to clarify, I think. Great. Thank you. As I glance at my watch and I glance at my colleague Marlene, I'm really in trouble. But it was well worth it, and uh, I hope you can join me in uh, thanking our panel. Great thanks uh, to the panel. We're now going to feed your stomachs as well as your minds. Let me give you a little information about that. Because we had over 350 registrants for this conference, we, we felt we had to divide uh, the group in terms of where we go for lunch because of space considerations. So those of you who are affiliated with Georgetown, students, faculty, special guests of Georgetown are invited to go to the Gworth, uh, which is uh, the 12th floor of the Gworth Student Center. There are going to be uh, guides for you, for those of you who may not be familiar with directions out in the foyer. The rest of you who are not formally affiliated with Georgetown are invited uh, to join us uh, for lunch at the Hyatt, just a, a block and a half down New Jersey. Again, there will be folks to guide you there. Uh, those of you who are affiliated with both, like John Podesta, may have two lunches. Um, we, uh, we encourage you to be back here promptly at 1.30 when Justice Goldstone will introduce the Chief Prosecutor of the International Criminal Port Court. And don't forget to buy the book on your way out. See you at 1.30. We have to do that too? <laughs>